We're going to move on to my presentation. I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to give you a bit of an up, a bit of a brief introduction to the beef supply chain development work that DAFWA, the Department of Agriculture and Food in WA, is, is now quite focused on. And hopefully I'll hit this the right way. We commenced this work in this new work in 2012 after about an 18-month gestation period. So imagine my surprise when I was recently deep in the Pilbara, in the great inland part of the world, at the Oski Roadhouse, and some people here will know where that is, and a couple of trucks pulled in. And all our problems apparently can be solved by the truckload now, because supply chain solutions can come in these 20-ton trailers. So much for the jokes. <laughs> Obviously too subtle. <laughs> Perhaps I should have asked you to jump up and down or something, I'm not sure. The program that we've settled on after this long gestation is the Beef Industry Change Program. And the program is a, a strong collaboration between the WA Beef Council which was uh, convened by the previous Minister for Agriculture, Minister Redmond, back in 2010, and is still going strong, and of course MLA. And it's a whole supply chain approach to market development. So instead of coming it from the supply end, we're coming it from the other end. And our aim is to develop robust beef supply chains, and along the way, quantify the WA industry's capability and capacity to consistency, consistently supply quality beef products. And the third C, which is missing, and I talk about the three Cs, capacity, capability, and, and the third one is confidence, or culture. And I think all through today we've heard um, about uh, research that is helping producers and supply chains to be confident in the product. And this is no different, but coming from a, a different way of looking at the same thing. We've got some key challenges along the way, because this isn't the sort of work that uh, Stu and Lee do, where you've got all these fine graphs and lots of uh, data points. It's really about people. And we need to ensure that uh, we can get our heads around and help industry uh, believe in what we're doing, and at the same time, deal with their beliefs and understandings of the, of the underlying drivers behind what are, if you like, our supply chain issues. And in Western Australia, our supply chain issues are such that we're, we've got, we're scale challenged. We've only got two million head of cattle, one million of which reside in the rangelands and one in the, in the softer agricultural country. We have three export abattoirs and we have lots of pinch points in our supply chains. You might say that we have less mature supply chains than you enjoy here in Queensland. And in doing this work, we've obviously got to identify willing participants. That is not as simple as it sounds, in a, even in a challenged, uh, scale-challenged industry like our own. So we've embarked, with the help of MLA, on some really different sort of work, looking to uh, s segment the industry. And this is not just producers, it's producers feedlotters, processors and end users, we're trying to segment their behaviours to try and get to the point where we better understand how some people deal better with other people and what are the va and how you would, if you like, frame your value proposition for each of those people along the supply chain. In doing so, build some confidence and, and if you like, build some resilience in the supply chain such that people can take a risk and not feel that the whole job's at stake. And if, if, if we do this and we can do it right, we can actually get to an integrated approach that will strengthen our supply chains. Some of our key messages um, that, that we, we think are there have actually been discussed in the, in the last uh, number of speakers that we've had today. Lost industry value equals opportunity. That equals supply chain benefits, potentially. They've also said earlier, and Peter Barnard said it very clearly, industry growth is through brief exports. And, I'll, and, and, and again, Western Australia's challenge compared to the eastern states, and particularly in Queensland, 
we have a situation where 75% of our beef produced in Western Australia goes to the domestic market and only 25% is actually exported as box beef. True, we have quite a, um, a focus on live exports, but that um, doesn't account for uh, the statistics that we heard earlier about the majority of beef being exported from the eastern states. So we're starting from a completely different, uh, I guess, perspective. So we, we do need new capability in our supply chains, but most of that is around business model improvement. We also need to look at the barriers to change. We've got a very, very fixated northern industry on, on live exports and, unfortunately, up until recent times, on one particular live export market. We have very limited, we don't have no, as it says on the thing, but we do have limited backgrounding. Uh, some backgrounding occurring in the Midwest, which is uh, based on perennial pastures, which is, which is turning out to be quite a, a handy uh, area for low cost growth and, and a growth pathway to, to better jobs. And as I said before, we have a, a domestic focus, but more than that in Western Australia, we have a domestic focus on zero tooth animals which is very different to the eastern states and I think it's something that we've had ingrained in our system for a long time. So we've got lots of myths and a lot of rural myths and a lot of perceptions that we've got to try and break down. And, and as I said before, the whole value proposition for change is, is a rounded one, not just about a dry economic argument. So we've actually got four main projects in the, in the beef industry change program. And the most advanced one is the Northern Market Diversification Project, which is headed up by uh, young Marna Stockdale. This particular project uh, has, has all of the goodies in it to make a really good project. We've got, and if this doesn't work, oh, look at that. We've got a big state. We have got lots of taxi fares going this way. We know that cattle travel down to South Australia. I'm missing a, a line there. We know cattle have headed to the, to the east and in 2010, from the whole of Western Australia, we lost about 165,000 cattle that went east to fill up the paddocks when you guys came out of the drought. So we've had some really large shocks in our system in, in the relative past, in the recent past. So we've got uh, the Rangelands area, which effectively is all of that part of Western Australia. We've got the agricultural areas. All of our um, abattoir capacity is here. There are some, uh, there is a proponent looking at an abattoir here, and of course we heard about the AA job in, in Darwin. So to get there and to help people with this value proposition of how we might diversify markets, we're doing a lot of bioeconomic analyticals, and that's, <laughs> that's a technical term. But you could say we're doing a bit of modelling, but modelling that's informed with real life data. Someone was mentioning earlier that there's lots of data, I think it was Libby saying yesterday or, or earlier in the NABRAC meeting, that there's uh, a lot of data sitting on data sets for cattle that have gone through uh, various supply chains, the same in, in the West, and we're actually mining that data and utilising actual commercial data in, in these, um, in these uh, analytics. We're looking at business model innovation. How can we do the business differently? Uh, it's interesting in one of our surveys, we've actually found that the loyalty to agents in our uh, producing uh, sector is extremely high. So there's a group that we've actually got to do a lot of work with. And we're going to apply some social science and behavioural approaches to, to challenge uh, to, to, the, to the challenge of trying to embed a modern supply chain ethos into, into what is a very traditional industry. So, it's not to say we're backing right away from live exports. And if you got that impression, I didn't mean you to get it. We're actually looking to optimise the whole turn off from a mixture of live and slaughter markets. And we've got, some ongoing, we've got some investigations just started into some new live export opportunities which fall under this same umbrella. There's an opportunity for increasing the, the export of productive heifers to Indonesia. Uh, there's some other export uh, specifications in Indonesia that are opportunities, as, as we just heard recently with the 25,000 head extras that they're requiring of slaughter cattle. 
We are also looking into live, live cattle to China, as will be most of Australia, because as we learnt from Peter, that is a, a huge market opportunity. Just a, a couple of things about, I guess, examples, Mick, about what, we, what we've been doing in this space, which is a little bit different. And it's around how do, we, uh, how do we understand our market, how do we understand how the supply chain responds. And as I said earlier, we have this WA um, uh, concentration in, in, in the domestic light cattle. And we're talking about 240 to 320 uh, days uh, and kilos, actually, uh, as a dress weight um, um, carcass and it's got to have no permanent teeth, and that's the difference. And I understand over here your domestic supermarket trade will take up uh, two teeth. And so we end up with a situation, unless you've got these young cattle, unless they're fitted up and they're doing the job for the domestic scene, you get lumped into all other products in our grids. We don't have very uh, sophisticated grids. You turn into an export job very quick. And uh, that is something where we, un we believe that we can get some more value out of this existing um, marketplace. What we have been doing is following cattle that are northern crossbred, uh, Brahmin crossbred cattle out of the north in Western Australia, going through a, a value add in a, in a feedlot for between 75 and 80 days, and they're coming out as MSA graded, not 50% um, Lee on your, your entire miles. These are heifers and steers. These are grading 96% MSA compliant. And it's a, it's a very well-worn path for these cattle and we're now getting these cattle ending up in boxes going to China. So we still have an opportunity, as we see it, for um, these other products to be more differentiated. And we could end up with uh, an opportunity for an EU job, a PR job and a Japox job. So we are very much in the uh, embryonic stages of developing these markets, but they are options and we're putting the numbers to them so that we've got our value proposition prop properly set. Another job that we've been looking at is getting further into the supply chain and thinking about our processing sector. Given that I said that we're very challenged with our three export works and a, and a number of smaller works, we've got to try and squeeze more value out of this sector as well. And if we if we take the, and this is based on some uh, actual costs, if you've got fixed costs, high fixed costs, sorry, high fixed costs and low throughput, you're going to struggle to make a dollar. And this is for the processing sector. So if they're not making a dollar, they're not passing on to the producer. If, at, whoops, I've done it again, and again. If, however, you can get into the blue line where you've got lower fixed costs and uh, higher throughput, then clearly you're in a, in a higher profitable area. And in Western Australia, one of our, um, I guess, um, attributes is that we have a Mediterranean system, uh, production system that has uh, grass in the spring and not much other times in the southwest. So aligning our cattle that are coming from the north into that value-added stream uh, has to take into account the fact that we have a, uh, a dip in our cattle supply during the winter months because there's no grass in the winter in the south and we have a increase in the price that matches that increase or decrease in supply. So we're trying to align, better align our supply, seasonal supply, so that our abattoirs can actually have a consistent throughput and therefore meet some of those requirements of the previous graph and be more profitable. These are some of the uh, uh, northern cattle that have come down to, uh, in this case, to Waruna, and they've been grazing under centre pivots during, during the autumn. To add up, these little cattle came down averaging about 180, 190 kilos, freshly weaned. Uh, they've come down onto some excellent, I mean, I've never seen as good um, stand and graze. Any dairy farmer in the southwest would be happy with the grass that these little chaps are on and they just bomb it and they do very well. And these are the flatbacks that are the, if you like, the preferred uh, type of cattle that are going through the feedlot system, coming out the other end 96% um, uh, graded MSA. And that's to our uh, boning group eight in Western Australia, not 10. So the way forward from here, and this is the wrap up slide, 
DAFWARE is committed to a supply chain approach. We want it to, to be a market driven rather than supply or production driven approach. The early results from our beef industry change program are encouraging, but only early. We would like to be able to give the meat to the, to the statement that the value of the chain should exceed the sum of its parts. And, and to help that along with our NABRAC partners, we're developing the Northern Beef Futures concept. And this is where the rubber will hit the road in relation to its uh, in integration with R&D. And just last week, our government uh, uh, announced that the, as part of our budget uh, that we will be getting some money for the development of a Northern Beef Development Centre. And there is huge potential now for a, a collaborative R&D platform across uh, the northern jurisdictions, uh, a diversified further diversified marketing development work, and, uh, and priority industry infrastructure. So, thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Brad. Um, my question is in relation to um, how in that what you've mapped out there, where does BJD fit into that? Because, I mean, it's, it's something that has arisen and I guess it's something we, you know, over time we will manage other potential problems. But how, how is that affecting your plans for this supply chain? Right now, it's not, not at all. Uh, as, as, as luck would have it, uh, the, the impact of the tracings from uh, Queensland into, into the Kimberley area have been relatively small uh, and that program is, is doing its, um, uh, the response to that is, is, is happening. Uh, the results so far from the testing that's been done have, have only found one infected bull. Uh, on a property that's not been uh, involved in in the process to date in terms of the, the movement of stock. The, the program that's been put in place is a risk management program approach, Mick, and, and that's, uh, and I think, the same across the top of Australia. Um, we haven't moved in Western Australia to change any of the zoning or, um, or, or change the rules, if you like. We're still pushing ahead with maintaining our uh, free area status. Um, it's a risk, and I think if you're getting at the point that it's a risk and we need risk management in this whole process, you're dead right. Um, the, the ability to move cattle uh, through to the south will only be impacted if we don't have the capability of utilising yards to dip cattle and move them through uh, as, as job lots or as, as, as groups, identified groups and traceable groups. At the, at the moment we're dealing with that through some risk management processes and part of the package that got announced last week includes priority infrastructure that, that could look at some um, uh, improving our yarding, our dip yard system to enable cattle to always meet a domestic market spec. Uh, it's, it's a good point and, and the risk management issues were, uh, are not lost uh, and will be included in this new work that we're embarking on.